Kentucky basketball is back on the recruiting trail, and they have scheduled a visit with one of the best shooting guards in the 2025 class. You are Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what's going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on into Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Dahl, writer for Sports Illustrated for various SEC-related things. But on this podcast, we take a dive into all things Kentucky athletics. Today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat over 50 infections. You can get yours today at jacemedical.com. That is J-A-S-E medical.com. On today's episode of Locked on Kentucky, we are going to be discussing Malik Thomas setting a visit with Kentucky basketball. Going to talk about what we know about Thomas. Also going to discuss the bracketology, the AP Top 25, the net, and then we're going to wrap things up talking a little bit about Kentucky basketball's Defense. How do we feel about the Cats on defense, and can they win an SEC title with the way that they're playing right now? Thank you so much for making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. Want to remind everyone out there that we are free and available on all platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the show. And if you're listening on podcast, I would greatly appreciate it if you subscribed there as well. So let's go ahead and get into it. Kentucky basketball scheduling a visit with five-star shooting guard Malik Thomas. You could put him as a combo guard. You could almost put him on the wing as he is listed at six foot six. Um, that's the way I've got him written down in my notes here just after watching some of his film on YouTube. Six foot six, about 175, 180 pounds, depending on where you look. Again, five-star guard across the board, according to the 24-7 Sports Composite Rankings. He is the number six player in the 2025 class, number one combo guard and number one player in the state of Pennsylvania coming out of Lincoln Park Performing Arts uh, High School in Midland, uh, Pennsylvania. Thing about Thomas that I want to note here right off the bat is he is fresh off of a visit with the Auburn Tigers, going to be monitoring that one heavily according to On3. This is a battle between Auburn, UConn, and Kentucky right now with Duke also in the mix as well. Kansas and Indiana, uh, other teams that have offered him that are notable uh, as well. But Malik Thomas, the thing about him when you go and watch his tape, it's a lanky, creative wing that can score in a variety of ways, but specifically, I like his stuff inside the paint. Some things that I noted about Thomas whenever looking at some of his film, he heavily favors his right hand when it comes to driving and finishing at the rim, but he's got aggressive speed and he's got great finishing ability on top of that. Again, like I mentioned, creative wing, there's so many different ways that he can twist and contort his body. Getting to the rim just, again, really favors that right hand when going to finish and going to handle the basketball as a whole. But he utilizes his length in great ways. Again, listed at six foot six, a little bit of a wiry frame. Has some weird balance, too. I talk about that ability to finish and the way that he can kind of move and twist in the air. But it's really interesting to watch him work in the mid-range because he sort of alternates between, in his highlight tapes, using that strong floater that he has, and he can get to that his spots inside the paint and right outside the paint, using that floater, again, because of his length, just being able to put a shot up over everybody. Uh, but he also tries to do, like, this pull-up jump shot where he kind of spins like oh, away from everybody and kind of pivots back to the basket while he's shooting the ball. It's a really interesting move, not one that I think you'll find consistent success with, uh, at the collegiate level or at the NBA level, unless you're just really, really built different. And Malik Thomas, so far through high school, has proven that he can hit that shot pretty consistently, and he is built different. I, I don't think that he has great shot selection based on watching his film. But again, I go back to the fact that he's got that wiry frame, got a little bit of bounce to him, some really nice speed and fluidity. It helps him create some space in that mid-range area and you see him consistently put down shots uh, in that spot. The floater game, like uh, I also noted this and just said it a second ago, is very, very strong. Uh, I, I would say that it's probably underutilized just based on what you see out of his performance at the Nike EYBL circuit. Um, you also th you would like to see, if we're criticizing 
things about his game. You would like to see him be more consistent coming off of ball screens. I can only assume Kentucky or whatever college team will take him will utilize him more in that way in the half-court offense, just giving him a lane and letting him drive to the basket because he found a lot of success in transition. And most of these high school prospects, these high-profile athletes do. They find guys that can create steals, get out in transition, run and dunk the ball or finish it uh, effectively. And that's somebody that Malik Malik Thomas is, but I think he can also create a little bit more in his half-court game. I see some potential there. Very talented, athletic player. If we're going to continue criticizing some things, his jump shot, to be honest with you, it it, it looks horrible at times. Like, just straight up horrible. Whether that be in the mid-range, whether it be working uh, from beyond the arc. I mean, it, it is it is just a weird-looking jumper at times. Nothing wrong with his balance, but he's got a really tight base, and sometimes he pulls the ball way too far behind his head whenever he's going to, to pull up and shoot. He goes straight up. There's nothing wrong with, the, nothing wrong with that. It's just, again, just a really tight base, usually, consistently, and he kind of pulls that ball back. And sometimes that has to do with the balance of where he is in the mid-range, but it can also happen at the three-point line, which you will see uh, in his highlight tapes. Um, Again, it it looks horrible at times. It doesn't look terrible at all times whenever he's given an opportunity to settle in catch-and-shoot situations. I I mean, it looks looks okay. But for a guy that is listed as a shooting guard, um, I I would like to see him be a little bit more consistent with that. But I don't know if that's going to change at this point, uh, to be honest with you. I find it interesting that 24-7 Sports, again, has him listed as a combo guard, um, but I, I just don't see him that way. I don't see, I don't see Malik Thomas uh, as a combo guard. I see him more as a shooting guard, possibly moving down to small forward in different lineups. This is a guy that I think can utilize his length uh, at the collegiate level in more ways than he is right now, and he's doing it in a lot of different ways. I just think that he can put a little bit more emphasis with the right personnel on specific things about his game that I think he can improve on and become uh, legitimate strengths uh, in in his offense. Also, you talk about the defense here. He's got length on defense to create steals. He did that consistently during the EYBL, uh, during the time he was on the circuit there, I believe with New Heights, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But overall, just all around, just a solid, solid prospect here. And Malik Thomas, he has scheduled an official visit with Kentucky, again, coming off of a visit with the Auburn Tigers, going to monitor UConn, Duke, and uh, Kansas and Indiana alongside the Tigers in this race. If you've got any thoughts about Malik Thomas and what he could be for Kentucky basketball, you can leave that in the YouTube comments below. All right, I want to talk a little bit here about the bracketology, give you an AP Top 25 update, give you a net rankings update, talk about quad one and so forth. Before we dive into all of that, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at FanDuel. The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there is still time to get in on the action with FanDuel. That is America's number one sports book because right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a five dollar bet that's 150 bucks win or lose in bonus bets the app is super easy to use they've got live same game parlays you can find bets in their new explore tab there's a parlay hub to get all of their popular parlays and more so you need to visit fanduel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup that is fanduel an official partner of the nfl All right, continuing along here on the Monday edition of Locked On Kentucky, Lance Dahl hanging out here with you. Really appreciate you making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. want to remind everyone out there that we are free and available on all platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the show. If you're listening on podcast, I would greatly appreciate it if you subscribed there as well. All right, so let's continue along here. We've got some bracketology Some AP Top 25 updates that I want to get to here. Let's start with the bracketology from our homeboy, Joe Lenardi, and he has dropped Kentucky to a three seed. Now, I want to be, I wanted to note here that he has not updated his bracketology since January 12th, 2024. So this came before Kentucky's loss to Texas A&M on the road on Saturday. But the interesting thing about Kentucky in this uh, bracketology, and we'll utilize this to further conversation later on in the show, is he now has UK as an automatic qualifier 
which means that he believes Kentucky will win the SEC. Tennessee is, or excuse me, at least at this point, yeah, no, projecting out, they would win the SEC uh, because right now they're 2-1 and one and Auburn and Alabama are sitting at 3-0. and oh. Actually, that may, honestly, I don't know if Joe Lenardi does his stuff like sitting where we are today or if it's a projection moving forward, like, hey, this is where these teams are going to finish because we've seen several teams that are are not projected to win their respective conferences uh, end up being automatic qualifiers because they started off uh, hot in their in their conference conference slate, um, even though everyone knows, hey, that this is not how this is going to finish. So maybe he just has Kentucky as the automatic qualifier before they took that loss, and now he's going to update that. I don't know. Maybe it's going to be Tennessee, who he currently has as a two seed. Could be Auburn. It could be Alabama. Right now, the Crimson Tide and the Tigers are tied for first in the SEC standings. So we'll see how that works. But I, I think that after further reflection on the way that the Texas A&M game went, I think that you can move past this one and chalk it up to a couple of different things. And we talked about this on the recap episode. You can chalk it up to a hardworking team at home having to play a one of the best offenses in the country and just simply having themselves arguably their best game of the season. It took for Kentucky to lose. It took overtime. And it took nearly 60 combined points from AM's two best guards on the road. Kentucky being on the road in overtime. That's what it took to beat the, UK, the, the Kentucky Wildcats. And that's a good, hardworking Texas A&M team. Credit them for their, their play in that game. And it's a quad one loss for Kentucky. Thank goodness. And I think we can move forward past this and say it's a quad one loss. You lost on the SEC against a good team. May not be a great team when all is said and done, but they had a great game. They had a great game. They're capable of it. Hats off to them. They played really well. It's not the end of the world for Kentucky or their seed line, I don't think. It's just a missed opportunity in the quad one. And that's okay because you've got several other places to look here in quad one opportunities. And let's go ahead and switch to the net since we're talking about it. So the net rankings, new computer model introduced in like 2018, 2019 has replaced RPI uh, or, or BPI, whatever it is that they used to use to help with the uh, with the NCAA tournament seeding. But now they've got the net rankings, and it ranks every single team in college basketball, divides them into quadrants, one, two, three, four, and depending on whether you are playing a team on the road, at home, or at a neutral site, um, where depending where they're at in the rankings, will determine whether or not it is a quad, it is a quad one, two, three, or four win slash loss, depending on the outcome of the game. So last time we talked about the net rankings, we went through the quad one opportunities for UK because those are the best teams in the nation or the most difficult wins in the nation that Kentucky could pick up uh, against respective teams. We went through and counted up how many different opportunities Kentucky has, what Kim Palm says about where they should be in those games, and they have the ability to potentially get up to eight quad one victories uh, this season. They have the ability to get up to that. Right now, there are there are several opportunities. Excuse me. They have the chance to get up to, let's see, I believe it's 12, actually, or 11 quad one wins, depending on whether or not things shake out uh, the right way. But just looking at the quad one opportunities that we saw last time, I'm going to update you to where those teams are at in the net rankings and whether or not they're still quad one opportunities. You had a quad one Potential win on the road at Texas A&M, who was ranked 39th in the net rankings. They needed to be ranked, I believe, 75th or higher in order for that to be a Q1 dub. Obviously, Kentucky lost that game, so it's a quad one loss. Texas A&M is currently ranked 41st in the net rankings. Hopefully, they don't go past that 75th uh, overall net ranking. Otherwise, there would be a quad two loss, which would be a problem. So that was a quad one opportunity that Kentucky missed on. Now you've got... At South Carolina, who went from 42nd to 51st or 54th now in the net rankings, that's still a quad one opportunity. Then you have a game against Tennessee at home, who is number six in the net rankings. You have an opportunity at Auburn, who is still number eight, against Alabama, who has risen to number four in the net rankings despite their 11 and five record. You also have a quad one opportunity against Mississippi State, who went from 32nd to 35th despite uh, splitting games between. Alabama and uh, Tennessee. 
We said that they could possibly go inside that top 30, which would give Kentucky a quad one opportunity on Wednesday. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen now. It will be a quad one opportunity on the road if Mississippi State does not fall apart. And then you got another Q1 potential game against Tennessee on the road to close things out. So you've got right there six more games that are definitive quad one opportunities. If you win all of those, you would have seven quad one wins. And then there are three more games that are bordering close to quad one opportunities. That Mississippi State game at home that I just told you guys about, I believe if Mississippi State climbs inside that top 30, then it would switch to a Q1 win for Kentucky later on in the season. So it's not going to be that now, but it could be later. You've got an opportunity at home against Florida, who is 49th in the net rankings, who've got some opportunities to win some big games between now and their second matchup against Kentucky inside Rupp. And then you've got Gonzaga, who has fallen from 45th to 50th since the last time we spoke in the net rankings. Still could be a possible top 30 team by the time they face Kentucky because they still have seven games to go between now and the time they face the Wildcats. But unfortunately for the Bulldogs, they lost to Santa Clara, who I believe is even outside the top 115 in the Ken Palm ratings. So not a good start for the Bulldogs so far this season. Not what they were over the past few years, uh, definitely. But if Kentucky somehow gets those games, then hey, you could be looking at 10 or 11 possible quad one victories if some other teams rise here uh, that Kentucky's beaten over these past uh, few weeks. So there are your quad one opportunities. There's your, uh, there's your net rankings update. There's your bracketology update. And then Kentucky in the AP Top 25 fell to number eight, which I thought was a little interesting. A lot of shakeup in the polls. Lots of shakeup in the AP Top 25 this week because so many, many uh, different teams lost, uh, but Kentucky's still hanging inside that top 10. So there's your update on all the di- different rankings and uh, projections out there. If you've got any thoughts on any of that, you can leave it in the YouTube comments below. I want to talk for a little bit here to close out the show about Kentucky's defense because right now um, it's not really cutting it if we're going to be if we're going to be honest and there's some concern about how it could affect the Wildcats uh, through this the rest of this uh, SEC slate. So before we get to that though, I want to tell you guys about our friends. Over at Jace Medical, I know we come to sports uh, to kind of escape from some of the crazy uh, realities in life, but can we talk for just a second about preparing for real life? Because according to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade. It's kind of scary out there, and I can't imagine a more helpless feeling if one of my loved ones got sick while a supply chain issue kept them from getting the life-saving medication that they needed. But thankfully... We can be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics that Jace Medical provides to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, sinuses, skin infections, among others. This stuff could happen to any of us. You can visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Again, you can go to jacemedical.com and use offer code Locked On to get $20 off your first order. All right, wrapping up the Monday edition of Locked On Kentucky. Again, if you've not subscribed to the show already, I would greatly appreciate it if you did that. We've got some thoughts here to close the show out about Kentucky's defense. So as I noted before SEC play started, I I gave like during an episode, I gave like five things that would constitute a successful SEC slate for Kentucky basketball. And one of the things was Kentucky climbing inside the top 40 in adjusted defensive efficiency on Kimpom. And they sat at about, I believe, 45th-ish, somewhere around there, uh, whenever we had that episode. And since that point, they've given up 85, 77, and 97 points in their first three SEC games. They're giving up 76 points per game as a team so far this year. And I've just kind of come to the conclusion that, look, this defense is not 
terrible by efficiency metrics. The points per game is bad. There is no slicing that any different way. It is clear we can talk all about these different efficiency ratings, the possession link, the offensive rebound percentage, the non-steal turnover percentage, which Kentucky is absolutely dog water in. We can talk about the ability to give up percentage, uh, percentage shots from three. We can talk about the pacing. We can talk about different components about the strength of schedule and whether or not they face good offense. It's all these different things. Yada, 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 yada. But the point being here is Kentucky has given up, pull it up in my notes, only thing I've got for this segment, 76 points per game. Ladies and gentlemen, that will not win you a national championship. It will not win you an SEC championship. I don't think Kentucky right now can win the SEC if they continue to play defense the way that they are. I said they needed to be in the top 40 and adjusted defensive efficiency. They dropped to 55th after that win or loss, excuse me, against Texas A&M. And through these next few games, I want to look at this with Kim with you on Kim Pong because Kim Pong's usually not that far off. Over these next few games, they are projected to give up defensively 75 points to Mississippi State, 74 to Georgia, 74 to South Carolina, 79 to Arkansas, 83 to Florida, 81 to Tennessee, 71 to Vanderbilt, and 80 to Gonzaga. Ladies and gentlemen, those defensive numbers will not get you an SEC title. You will lose a couple of games there that you don't expect to lose. If you continue to play the de- the way you played on defense against Texas A&M, you have to be better at stopping ball screens and drives to the basket. You have to be better at switching and not leaving a guy open whenever the ball is getting rotated and reversed around the around the half court offense. You have to be able to close out on shooters and put your freaking hand up whenever a, a shooter is left alone in a catch and shoot situation, and he's going to pull the trigger. Like you know, he's going to. You have to be more aggressive on the defensive end. Kentucky just has not really had that so far this season, and they've looked really, really rough at times. Again, the efficiency numbers will tell you they're fine to slightly below average to slightly above average in different categories. But at the end of the day, 76 points per game. If you do that for the rest of the slate, on average, if you give up 77 or 76 points per game, You'll win a large large chunk of your games, but you ain't winning an SEC title. You are not winning an SEC title because that's going to include 85 against Gonzaga. It's going to include 85 against Auburn. It's going to include goodness knows how many against a team like Alabama who loves to shoot the three. It's just going it's going to be a very, very rough season for Kentucky in terms of the emotional wear and tear of their fan base if they continue to Give up all of these different points in this con- in these contests because here's the thing: the offense is so good, it's really really good. Minus the ability to rebound the basketball offensively, minus the ability to get second chance points, it's really stinking good. But it can't be on fire forever. You're going to end up costing yourself in one of these games, and it's going to stink. It's going to stink whenever your team scores 77 and you lose by three. It's going to stink whenever you look up and say, man, the defense really held us out of this one, and we can't rely on the offense to do what it's done forever. So I think that Kentucky can get slightly better. I think that there are things that you see on this defense with their rebounding, with their ability to go through screens, again, their ability to switch. These things are fixable. They are fixable. Kentucky just hasn't fixed them yet. They just haven't. So that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Kentucky. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On UK. You can follow me on Twitter at Lance Dahl underscore. And you can follow the show on Instagram. That is at Kentucky Podcast. Any questions, comments, concerns, leave those in the YouTube comments below. Hit me on the socials. I will see you all tomorrow for another episode of Locked On Kentucky. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day. And God bless.